so with that, um, uh, we're in the studio today with Dr. Kathy Hart. Um, she is the most recent superintendent and uh, president of San Joaquin Delta College, which is one of the largest community colleges in the state of California and probably one of the largest ones in the United States. <laughs> I am an alumna of her school. Um, I was able to go to San Joaquin Delta College before I came to the University of the Pacific. And we're here today in the beautiful campus, Stockton campus of the University of the Pacific. Um, we're so excited. Excited to have you in studio. Dr. It's great Hart. to be here. Great to be here. <laughs> so wonderful. Um, so uh, you and I would see each other in the higher education world out and about, you know, so you were doing your leadership thing as president of Delta. And I think at that time, I was probably uh, a leader still down in sometime down in Los Angeles. And then I came to, to San Francisco and I would see you at conferences. Mm -hmm. And then last year, I came back home and uh, to work at, at the University of the Pacific, where I'm now. And you had just recently um, um, had had uh, retired from San Joaquin yes, University College. Yes, I retired. So, so, um, and then you and I have connected on other things, uh, yes. particularly as it relates to diversity mm -hmm. issues, uh, particularly in organizations. Um, some of the things that you do is that you have always been a community steward, so clearly as a top educator um, uh, in, in the county, um, in California, in Stockton, but you've also served and you continue to serve on boards. Um, you and I met with some of the work that you were doing to try to advance diversity, equity, inclusion in your work as a board member on the board of directors for the Hagen Museum. Yes. Which is, you know, uh, would be the seminal signature museum of mm -hmm. the Stockton community. You are also on the board of a signature um, arts organization, the Stockton Symphony, mm -hmm. on the board of, uh, of trustees there. Um, I know that you're involved with United Way. You're involved in other organizations. Um, I understand that you have been and you may continue to be involved with the Stockton Arts Commission. I was for I was a member of the Arts Commission for a long time, but I am no longer a okay. member of that. But I am a. I'm a big arts supporter. Of course, you're a big arts supporter. So education, arts, um, the development of people uh, to be their their fullest potentials. I think that that has kind of been the life, your life's work. Um, this uh, podcast uh, is called Humanizing Us. And uh, my work uh, being both a higher education leader, uh, particularly through the lens of social justice and, these, and the promise of equity and inclusion is really you know about this, what this podcast is about, and I'm bring, I like to bring people that I think that get that work, understand it, <laughs> and are using and ha have used and continue using their platforms um, to to advance it. I want to um, maybe um, do a little bit of formation. You know, find out a little bit about your formation sure. process. Um, I know you're a native of Indiana. I am, and um, you know, tell uh, share with us um, a little bit about your early kind of life education experiences that kind of put you on the pathway. You know, I, I, I gave an introduction to many of the crowning pieces of, 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 mm -hmm. of your identity, but there's, there's parts of your formation that I think the listening audience um, could learn from to understand how you became the educator that you became and even, you know, the ways in which you understand these issues of equity and social justice to really be kind of important in this work. Sure. Um, I grew up in Valparaiso, Indiana. Mm -hmm. It was a completely white town. Um, even though it was very close to Gary, it was, it was completely white. Um, it was also very Protestant. And we, my family is Catholic. Mm -hmm. And so, and I, you know, I mean, when you're a little kid, you, you don't think anybody's any different and you, and you don't even see anybody being any different. So I was, you know, I grew up in a happy family that was doing fine and everything was good. When I went, then my parents put me in Catholic school. I couldn't go to kindergarten because they were going to put me in Catholic school, and that kindergarten was a, it was 
uh, public school, so I wasn't able to go to kindergarten. I, and I was very upset about that because I really wanted to go to school. And uh, so when I went to Catholic school, I, everything was fine, except that we weren't allowed, we weren't bused to the Catholic school. We lived out in the country, and we had to get a, we had to be taken to school. Yeah much like everybody takes their kid to school now, yeah, yeah, which is yeah. kind of weird. But mm -hmm. anyway, um, that was the first time I thought, well, this is odd. Why, uh, we'd see the bus go by every day. Why can't we get on that bus? Uh -huh. So that was kind of my first experience of being excluded. Yes. Uh -huh. um, and then later, um, various things would happen where um, even in the Catholic school, the, the teachers would sometimes, I mostly had lay teachers, but teachers would sometimes say things like, well, if you're not Catholic, you won't go to heaven. Well, my mother's family was not Catholic. And so now again, I'm like, well, what? Now wait a minute. <laughs> what is the, all this about? I mean, we're being told about God and about Jesus and about all of these things and how wonderful and everybody's a big happy family, but I'm not being being part of that family because I've got these relatives who I love. Yeah very much who are now being excluded. So I guess that's the kind of kernel that started me realizing that everything wasn't as it seemed. Yeah. <clears throat> and, um, oh, various things happened along the way. My father wanted to run for office, and he did. But there were, there was, it was a very, um, the Masons were very big in this little white town, <laughs> of course. And um, he, he, so he had a very difficult time. And people would say to him, well, you really probably shouldn't try to do this because the Masons won't be behind you. And, you know, again, it was just, it, it, this just didn't feel good at all. Mm -hmm. I know it's a very different experience from if I were black or if I were Asian or if I were Hispanic, but you just get that, the feeling of being excluded for no reason. Is universal. Is just, I think it totally is. and. So that was very disturbing, and it's had, and it always, it was always there. Yeah. It was always on my mind. Um, in high school, well, again in high school, same kind of thing. I went to the eighth grade at the Catholic school. The rest of the kids, the non-Catholic kids, went to junior high. And they formed all their high school, pre-high school cliques. Mm -hmm. And then my classmates and I showed up in the ninth grade. And it was like we were weird because, <laughs> because we, we had to stand when we responded in school, in Catholic school. Well, of course, they didn't do that. Yeah at the public school, yeah. and it was hysteric. You know, it was like all the kids thought that was hysterical that we would ha that we would stand because you'd forget. Yes, and you'd stand up. <laughs> and uh, so, so I, I, I continually would get these reminders. Mm -hmm. And people don't understand the power of, of the two, these two particular social constructs, um, this uh, disability, which is also ableism, um, uh, and then what you're describing, Kathy, this idea of religious exclusion. Right. Religious exclusion is one of the most significant exclusions, it, not only in the United States, but in, but in the world. world. <laughs> in the world, yeah. <laughs> it's been going on and, for a very long time. And it's even weirder because, well, and 
And in some religions, there are outward signs of uh, a person's religion. Mm -hmm. But in, in most cases, there's no, there's no way to pick somebody out. Mm -hmm. But nevertheless, people are very good at that. They're very good at finding difference and not liking it or not respecting it. Yeah. Yeah. And so I think all along, I've just always had that in the back of my mind that um, it, that that injustice, it's just not right. Mm -hmm. And that, that injustice thing is a common, it's a common, you use the kernel, you, you said that word kernel. It's a common kernel that you'll find across all individuals who fight for issues of social justice. It doesn't even matter what job they take in life, what career trajectory they take. Um, and even they, different people do different things. So how they do it based upon their personality and opportunity right. access. That's a lot of. There's a lot of differentiating, differentiating factors, Kathy. But you talked about this being of once you once you have that kernel of social justice, um, it always stays there. Yeah, it like kind of pops and goes. Yes, it does. <laughs> it does. So let's talk a little bit about your pathway to becoming an educator. You know, um, um, I know mostly about your career when you landed in um, Delta because you were at Delta right. prior prior to your retirement. You work almost a quarter of a century. Yes, at, at absolutely. Delta College. Absolutely. So talk a little bit about you know what brought you to Delta okay. and, and 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 that identity, that early formative identity, the the experiences that you just talked about, how those uh, followed you into the classroom as a, an instructor, as sure. a dean, and so on and so forth. So um, my mother, one of my mother's cousins, was an English teacher, and by the way, I'm left-handed. <laughs> which was another thing that made me different. Absolutely. It's very much an appreciating factor. <laughs> Absolutely. So this cousin, mm -hmm. my mother's cousin, uh, was an English teacher, and she was also left-handed, and she taught me how to write so I didn't write upside down like most left-handed people. So I wasn't as noticeable. Mm -hmm. And I didn't, and the, si like and the sisters didn't <laughs> slap my hands. <laughs> so... Um, we became, we were always very close, uh, a close knit family. Um, of I had a lot of, aunt, of great aunts and grandparents who were around, so um, this woman and I became very close. And I wanted to be like her. She was an English teacher. I wanted to be an English teacher, and so um, and I did well in those the in. I did well in high school and everything, but but really I realized in college that English was the thing that I should really pursue. Um, I love to read, um, and I read very widely all kinds of things. And um, she was, it was funny because she and I were very different kind of teachers. She was very strict and very um, concerned about behavior in her classroom. I mean, it was, it was, I would say she was very old fashioned. Mm -hmm. And when I was going through, I went to Purdue um, as an undergrad uh -huh. and uh, that's where I, and I did, I actually did my student teaching at the high school that, or at the junior high that I ended up teaching at in my hometown. And um, I just, I, 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 I loved her as a person, but she was nothing like the person that she was really in her classroom. Hmm. It was all business and all, you know, um, it was very, it was not a very welcoming classroom, I would say. <laughs> And what I wanted, and, and at the time that I got my first job, which I was 21 years old, and the kids were 14, 13, 14, 15. 
So I wasn't much older than yeah. them. Yeah. And I, I really liked them. And I thought that they were hilarious mm -hmm. also. That was one of the things that I found their, their misbehavior funny yeah. rather than horrifying. Yeah. <laughs> And, and they probably knew that. Well, in thinking back, you know, uh, what was horrifying then or what would have been horrifying then is totally not, yeah. you know, I mean, <laughs> they don't. Yeah. <laughs> so um, anyway, I I was, I think I was a good teacher. I, I did a lot of real, I spent loads of time trying to be interesting and get the kids interested and get them learning. And I think that, that I did a pretty good job. But the atmosphere of the junior high was more like my cousin's idea of how a school should be than mine. And so I, after one year, I decided I'll teach, I'll do one more year because I don't, I don't have any place to go or any, anything, <laughs> anything to do. But I got to get out of here because mm. I need to go back to school. I, I had no interest in administration at the time, none, because I figured that would put me in a place of being this authority mm. figure. And I would end up being like an assistant principal, which was my, would be my worst nightmare. <laughs> That's a disciplinarian. <laughs> right. Oh, no, no. Uh, no, I'm not. A, I'm very not a good disciplinarian. So um, I went to Bowling Green State University. Yes, yeah. That's and, uh, Ohio? Yeah. Uh -huh. It's Bowling Green, Ohio. It's about... Um, it's right down 75 from, actually from Ann Arbor. So okay. that was why I always thought, well, if I go back to school after this first time, uh, I would go up there. Uh -huh. So I ended up, um, I was one of the only people in this, we, we had a very large class of English majors in this master's program. A bunch of different programs, American Studies, American um, um, Creative Writing, and regular English. And there were about 50 new grad students the year that I came. Wow. And big the, year. yeah, big class. And the director of freshman English, which is what we all taught, um, found out that I had taught English at those last couple years. And so he said... Uh, would you like to help be help me with these other three or four people who would be like the mentor grad students for the new for the new yeah. students? So, so I was mentoring my peers from the very beginning. Yeah, well, you're thrust into a leadership role. Yeah, and um, I, and then he left and went to another college, and uh, and and he was replaced. And I continued on doing this. I did that job for about, um, as a grad student, I did it about three, four years. And then I was a full-time employee for the university at doing the same basic job. Got it. So um, I had a lot of experience supervising teachers, you know, watching people teach, helping them work with students. And in that environment, I didn't have to be a disciplinarian. Mm -hmm. I mean, it was that was so much fun. I really enjoyed that job. Um, then I actually inherited a little money from this cousin who, uh, mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, the people come back yeah. and forth. So I inherited a little money from her and her sister. And I thought, you know, I was 40. I thought, you know, I love this job now, but am I going to love this job in 10 years, 20 years? And the answer was, I don't know. I don't, I, I feel like I need to do something different. So I was able to get a leave of absence from the, uh, job. From the job. Uh -huh. So I could go back if I wanted to. I kind of knew I wouldn't, but. I, I did, I had that safety net, which I, is something that I need. Mm -hmm. And um, so I went off to the University of Michigan 
Um, and I had a research assistantship the first semester, and that was a lot of, I really learned a lot. And what I mostly learned was, and I, I feel so fortunate that I was able to do this because most of the people that I knew um, had to go, had to work, had to work full time and go to school. And this little bit of money that I inherited allowed me to be a full time student wow. and a and gave me the research assistance. And later I was able to do students, supervise student teachers mm -hmm. for money. So it, my job and my work were interrelated like they had always been. Mm -hmm. And th I loved that. Yeah. And I felt very bad because a number of the minority students that were in that program, what, what the university did with them was actually give them fellowships that didn't require that they do anything. Hmm. So they, well, if you're not connected <laughs> in, you know, if you're not around and you're not connected to the program, mm -hmm. you're, nobody gives you anything. You know, you don't get the things that other people do. And I, I remember talking to um, one, of the, um, one of the supervisors and saying, you know, I, you guys got this backwards, I think. You should, be, you should be giving these students research assistantships and teaching assistantships because that connects them better to the program, to the students. And they, and then you will notice that they have talent, and you will you will give them things. You will you will include them in, in in things. They didn't do you know they thought they were doing these students a favor. So once again, you know, people meaning well. Absolutely. So you're already getting engaged um, as an educator, even as a researcher, as an educator early on. Um, what brought you to California? So I finished my, I, I was just about finished with my degree and I had never applied, actually applied for a job before. I had just gotten them. And so I thought, well, you better apply for a couple of jobs just to see if you can do it. And uh, so I did. And one of them was this, it was a assistant division chair in communication skills at Delta. Uh, very far down the food chain uh, uh, as an administrator, but it was it was fine. So I came to California um, in a 14-foot U-Haul wow. <laughs> with my cat <laughs> in, in, in tow. So um, I, and I let my, my boyfriend at the time was living in my house in in Bowling Green still, so I was going to need to sell that house, and that romance was over. So <laughs> we, uh, so I came out here, and the first thing that struck me was the diversity. I, it, University of Michigan was fairly diverse, but nothing like out here. Nothing like it. Yeah. And it was it was so wonderful. I had a, a English seventy nine class, which was a one one below the 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 required class, the one A. Yeah. And in that class, I had I had students from everywhere. Yeah, and that was probably just faced with a multiracial. Well, and absolutely, there were there were kids from South America. Mm -hmm. I mean, I expected that there would be kids from Mexico, but mm -hmm. they were from everywhere. Mm -hmm. And then there were also the the Southeast Asians, the mm -hmm. who had and all of these students had the most amazing stories. And of course, in a composition class, you you know what are they going to write about? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> So I, I just fell in love with all of the stories and, and seeing the hardships 
that was another thing that always really struck me is because I I've had it really easy. My family, I didn't, I never was in any kind of debt. I was able to do all these things just without a problem. And I saw so many students at Delta who were overcoming like mm. amazing hardships. Yeah. I remember one day a girl came into my office and she said um, she was very pregnant and she was trying to get in a class. And I said, but the class has already started and it looks like you're going to need to take some time off. Do you? Oh, she said, oh, no, I'm, I'll just have the baby and then I'll be right back. <laughs> And I was like, oh my gosh. <laughs> so you probably, from the very beginning, attracted students and attracted students who were also um, looking for a mentor, seeking, you know, community, um, and, and were drawn to you. Talk a little bit about some, one of your first challenges you can remember around any equity and inclusion issue that you were engaged in in the classroom or outside the classroom at Delta, an uh, issue that came to your attention. And today we would definitely say, right. Whew, Whew. that's, that's, that's terrible, yeah. Well, there was, um, from time to time, the, the, the unit that I was attached to at the very beginning had just about everything you could imagine. It had all the remediation in it, which now is gone good. <laughs> And it had... Oh, yeah, remediation is completely gone out of the, the yeah. California uh, Community College system. Yes. That's right. And, um, and good riddance mm -hmm. because people... Uh, it, it was not meant to be what it became. Mm -hmm. But what it became was a way to keep people back. It wasn't intended to be that. It was intended to help them yeah, get rich. where they wanted to go. But then it became, but, um, yeah, they got stuck. But, but, yeah, and they, and, and they couldn't get anywhere. But one of the things that in the process of that, the, the reading program was in my division and the learning disabilities program, all of this mm -hmm. stuff. And I remember one day when um, mm -hmm. someone came and said, I'm really worried about this student because her husband is does not want her to go to school. And he's coming around and we need to get, you know, I mean, we don't want to get involved in this family problem, but this young woman has promise and she she should be allowed to do this. And so we worked on ways to have her sort of clandestinely stay in, in the program as long as she could. I don't know whatever happened to her, but um, those are the kinds of things that you run into in any college. Yeah. yeah. In any college. It doesn't matter, you know, it's... Yeah. But the the overwhelming number of students at at a community college who are they're just that far away from yeah. falling off the edge Absolutely. yeah and um so everything you try everything you do is trying to keep them safe and yeah. in school and and um, progressing, toward, progressing, yeah, toward a degree, a certificate, or, a certificate. Yeah, or something, type of completion. So I have always believed that the community colleges, and particularly the community colleges in the state of California, are at the intersections of all the greatest issues that um, society is 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 experiencing, um, and that if there's marginalization that's happening in society, you're going to see it. it you're going to see it even more so in the community college. Yeah. Um, and it's for a, a host of reasons, not because of the individuals. It's just the ways in which 
the mission of the California Community Colleges is has this kind of open open admissions. Right. Um, um, it is in many ways the economic driver uh, of of California because people come for all kinds of job skills and uh, educational needs, um, and you re- you meet people right where they're at. Absolutely. So, talk to me. What are some of the lessons? Some of the things that you have learned. And leading specifically as a post-secondary leader, higher education leader, leading in a California community college as it relates to these issues of equity. You've already hinted at it about that remediation, and remediation, oh, yeah. remediation which was a stumbling block. Yeah. Um, but what are some things you learned specifically with the population of, of people who come for education at a community college? Well, for one thing, people come there for a lot of different reasons. Mm-hmm. Uh, people, <laughs> people with money send their kids there because they want to save the money. Mm-hmm. Um, and so you have a very, socioeconomically, it's, it's the broadest spe- spectrum. Mm-hmm. So there are some kids who are there, people who are there, mm-hmm. and they're not all kids. Yeah, that, that's another, yeah. another difference. Yeah. Um, people who are there who are... Mm-hmm. You know they're they're upper middle class and they're they they don't and of course those students weren't in those remedial classes so the remediation was very um, you know it was like how how does this happen basically it was replicating the way that inequity happens in society. yeah. Yeah, they had poor. They were poor. They probably were browner or blacker. They probably had uh, absolutely less, less uh, uh, or n- or non English speakers. Speakers. They probably would have uh, not have had citizenship or right. were struggling with their immigration status. All these things that marginalized them in society. They were probably congregated. Yeah, they, <laughs> oh, they were. they were. They were, and those re- those remedial tracks seem to. They would trap people in these. It, it, it was like almost like pods, mm. and they would just they couldn't get out. And what was really kind of horrifying was that the people who taught in the that program mm-hmm. were so well meaning. Of course, I can imagine they loved their students, and it was like. They loved them to death. <laughs> I mean, it, it was it was it was scary mm. because they just didn't want. They never wanted. They were never good enough to go mm. to the next step. Kind wow. of. That's a really powerful, powerful you it, know statement. It was it was horrible. It was horrible, and that you know the, that people would believe that they were doing the right thing. Mm. And with such fervor, mm-hmm. but they were holding people back. And and, and when the state finally figured it out, I, and that's I'll I will say that Eloy Oakley yeah. is a genius for uh, for removing that. Removing that. Uh-huh. And for I mean it was was I've never seen anything work, go so fast. Wow. He, it, it was just the right time when people were just totally sick of it. Mm-hmm. And away it went. No more remediation. See One that. semester yeah. is the most, the most you, can you can do. do. But you've got to get them to the... To the and they, they do fine. Yeah, yeah. That's what they've discovered is that allowed to go into the upper classes, they, they do fine in English and in math. Yeah. Wow. The math people, the math faculty was much more outraged about it than the reading in English. It was interesting because mm-hmm. they, uh, they seemed to, the reading in English seemed to get it better, you know, to understand and not to take it as though they had been horrible people but that this was the right thing to do. This, you know, was like, don't beat, you know, it doesn't do any good to beat yourself up. 
when you thought you were doing the right thing, but then give it up when you find out that you aren't doing the right thing. And uh, what I noticed was that the, the math faculty were much less able mm. to do, because they're, you know, to them, you either know how to do it or you don't know how to do it. Yeah, there's no, there's no gray. There's no gray. So I want to pivot a little bit um, about, you know, you've been sharing really great information with us um, uh, about your life as an educator and as a career as an educator. And you've been documented to say that this community, Stockton, is clearly your home. Um, you've won the Athena Award, which really uh, recognizes women who are leaders in their community in 2020. 2013, mm -hmm. you've been the Educator of the Year, um, um, in 2016, the Asian American uh, Chamber of Commerce recognized you, uh, there's other awards that you've had, but this idea of leading uh, at a time like this in this community, which is your home, Stockton, you know, as we kind of get closer to, towards the, you know, the, 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 end of our, our, our time together that we have and that we can continue talking a lot more. Um, what are some of the things that you think are really important as we think about Stockton, San Joaquin County, and we think about, you know, how do we create more humanizing spaces educationally, but even the other, other quality of life issues as well? Well, I, you know, I wish I knew. <laughs> <laughs> I really wish I knew. Um, I've, one of the problems that I see in Stockton is the way, the way that people are segregated socioeconomically, really. Mm. Um, but that also means there's racial segregation. And there's, I just learned this not very long ago, that the redlining that took place in this community wasn't, the manuf wasn't manufactured by the developers, which I had always heard it was. It was a function of the federal government, yeah. which created the, these categories. Yeah. Yeah. And said that if you were in the yellow group, you couldn't live in the whatever, green group. Absolutely. And so on. And the red line group was always the worst. We're, right. Or where people were considered right. homes that would not uh, retain their value and the communities were probably not very safe. Right. Exactly. And that, I think, has not changed much. I think there I think there are a lot of I think there are a lot more people right now who are aware and who are trying to do something. But these things are unbelievably difficult. Um because they're so ingrained and people have to have an education first then. Right. Yeah. And they, I mean, they, the people themselves have to want to, you know, you, you run into these situations where, because I want something for somebody, doesn't necessarily mean that they want it for themselves. Absolutely. And how do you, how do you bridge that gap uh, it's patronizing to say, well, you ought to want to live in Brookside. Mm -hmm. Well, they don't want to, you know, they don't want to live. live there. But they, I suspect, or I, I think, that they want better for themselves and their children. But they want better where they're at. Where the, yeah. And I think that's... And that's a different vision. A very different vision. As opposed to a self-imposed yeah. vision that's based upon... A society that was created unequally. Uh, exactly. In the, in the first place. In the first place. And I have nothing against Brookside. I think it's a no, no. lovely place. But um, it exists in a very unequal and unfair way. Exactly. World. That's exactly. It exists. What's <laughs> interesting about it in some ways is that 
it's actually, at least in the little neighborhood where I live, it's actually become quite a bit more diverse mm -hmm. because people have the money. They've, they have enough money, they have a good, good enough job mm -hmm. that they have enough money to purchase something in that place. Yes. Whereas they wouldn't have 20 years ago. Absolutely. You know, so some people will say, well, that's progress. It is, it is but it's not enough. It's not, it's no. not enough. Yeah, because you're not getting to the underlying issue. No. Kathy, there's a lot of work that we have to do. You and I talk about that. We've talked about that, you know. Um, and we've even said, you know, sitting down together, you said, you, you uh, as a retiree educator, and, and I'm there, he's, you, you said to me, Mary, you know, I'm passing the baton off to you. <laughs> but the thing is that we both are passing the baton with and among each other. Yes. Because we need community stewards such as yourself. What do you hope to see happen, you know, in this phase of your life? What are you hoping to see? Because... Well, move the ball forward. well, I hope I quit hearing of all these terrible things that people have done to one another in the past, but I don't like my chances of that happening. Um, but in this city, I, 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 I led this uh, equity, diversity, and inclusion um, effort with the Stockton Symphony. And it, and as you know, I was trying to do one at the museum. Well, I, I succeeded fairly well with the symphony. Mm. We were able to get a consultant. We worked with her for over a year. She did a great job Wonderful. with them. Wonderful. Uh, we, we ended up with a strategic plan and we're still, you, you know, I mean, I'm still I'm still leading the group and yeah. we're still doing it mm -hmm. and we're making progress. We're trying to diversify our audience because it we have to. Yeah. Both and and it's not just it's not just race and ethnicity, it's it's age and where people live Absolutely. and everything. Uh -huh. Because th that things like the symphony and the museum have They've they've not aged well, and I I I have spent quite a bit of time thinking about this, about my generation, which I think did a really lousy. I mean, as many as many people as I have mentored over my life, and I I feel very good about that, but I don't think as a generation, baby boomers have done a very good job of mentoring people behind them. They've been too busy climbing. And if you're climbing, you're not looking back. And that's what I, that's what I hope to do is, is really help people know that, you know, the best thing you can do is help somebody who, who wants, you know, even who doesn't want your help, but, but help somebody succeed. Yeah, help them along the way. Along the way, yeah. Yeah. Well, you know, um, that is the work that I have been known uh, from you. That's what I see in you. I am just so pleased just to be able to have just a little bit of time with you today, you know, just to kind of talk about, you know, how you're living your life and in and, and this, you know, realm of uh, trying to be more human. We're all trying to be more I'll human. Try, I'll try it. <laughs> Well, we we don't we don't have a lot of really good examples. Yeah, but you are one of them. Yeah. Thank you. Absolutely, Thank you. very much so. And I look I I look forward to all of our meetings. I look to you for your your thoughtful input. Um, I look to you for your advice and your guidance. And I'm just so grateful that educators like myself. And those of us that are here in this community have you. And I just want to thank you so much uh, for being in studio today. Well, thank you for asking me. I really appreciate it. Absolutely.